Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Welcome to my video on the theory of person-centered therapy. Person-centered therapy was developed by Carl Rogers, and it emphasizes the relationship between the counselor and the client, and the ability of a client to self-actualize. So let's start by taking a look at the theory of personality behind person-centered therapy. Under this theory, human development is consistent with positive growth, which is different than many of the therapies that were being used at the time Rogers developed person-centered therapy. Individuals need positive regard, and they have to have it for themselves, and they need it from others as well. The optimal level of human functioning is achieved when these needs for positive regard are satisfied. Consistent with existential therapy, Rogers believed that human beings had a capacity for self-awareness, that they searched for meaning in their lives, and that they sought to resolve the tension between freedom and responsibility. Rogers believed that clients have the ability to cope with a wide range of thoughts, feelings, and behaviors, that they have the potential for change, and he felt it was important that counselors believe in this potential for change. He believed that clients can achieve self-directed growth. Clients seek congruence between self and experience, and this is really a key part of person-centered therapy this idea of congruence between a human being and their understanding of themselves and their understanding of their experiences. And another key part is this strive for self-actualization and to become a fully functioning person. Self-actualization is the tendency to express and activate all the capacities of a person. So let's take a look at what causes symptoms under the theory of person-centered therapy. And not surprisingly, incongruence is a major cause of symptoms. Rogers believed that the feeling of incongruence would first start when an individual usually as a child, encountered conditional worth. That is, when their worth appeared dependent on something they did or did not do. This incongruence is thought to produce anxiety, and this anxiety is thought to lead that a sense to a sense that the unified self is under attack. When a person believes that the unified, unified self is under attack, they engage in efforts to relieve anxiety. And two of these main efforts are denial and defensiveness. Rogers also believed that frustrated basic impulses, again, this is mostly in childhood, uh, lead to negative feelings and a lack of development of social skills. So with these causes of symptoms in mind, let's take a look at the techniques of person-centered therapy. Now, unlike many other counseling therapies, person-centered therapy does not have a lot of traditional techniques. In this way, it's similar to existential therapy. It's more about the creation of a therapeutic environment that facilitates the client to have congruence between themselves the idea of self, and their experiences. So this development of the therapeutic alliance is the technique in person-centered therapy. Now this technique can be developed into, or broken down into several sub-techniques, and I'll, I'll talk about that. But first let's take a look at the six conditions that Rogers believed led to therapeutic change. The first one is that the counselor and the client have to be in psychological contact. And the idea here is there, there has to be a relationship 
so that the counselor is able to have an impact on the client and the client is able to have an impact on the counselor. Now, oftentimes we take this for granted that a counselor and a client do have psychological contact between them. But this is not always the case. And psychological contact, this level is not met simply by a counselor and a client being in the same room. The second condition that leads to client change is that the client is experiencing incongruence. So without this incongruence, without this level of distress, client change is not possible. The third condition is that the counselor is congruent and genuine. And sometimes we refer to this as being authentic. So to meet this condition, a counselor needs to be aware of themselves, aware of their level of communication with the client, be open in relationships, and be spontaneous. The fourth condition is that the counselor shows unconditional positive regard. We also refer to this as a non-judgmental stance. So the counselor does not establish any conditions of worth. Now what's particularly interesting about this level, this condition, is that Rogers considered both positive and negative judgments to be disruptive to client change. Now it is particularly common in other counseling modalities for a counselor not to make negative judgments, but positive judgments are fairly common in counseling therapies. The fifth condition is that the counselor experiences and expresses empathy toward the client. That is, they effectively communicate their understanding of a client's feelings. And the sixth condition is that the client perceives the sympathy and acceptance by the counselor. So expressing empathy and being empathetic isn't enough by itself. The client has to understand and appreciate that empathy and feel accepted by the counselor. Now moving on with techniques. And again, the main technique, of course, in Person Centered is the building of that therapeutic alliance. So you could think of the items on the left here as sub-techniques of that attempt to build a therapeutic alliance. And one of the most notable is the concept of non-directiveness. And this is an area of person-centered therapy that is much different than many other counseling therapies. Counseling therapies in general have directive components to various degrees, but in person-centered therapy, in the theory of person-centered therapy, a counselor needs to be non-directive all the time. A counselor needs to generate an environment that facilitates change, as I mentioned earlier. And non-directiveness is a really key part of building that correct environment. Next, the counselor needs to be good at active listening. And that includes paraphrasing, reflecting, clarifying, and summarizing. But there is no providing of advice and no questions and no interpretations. Taking a look at the right side here, I have some items listed. I have the stages of therapeutic progress. And these stages were proposed by Rogers and they're fairly straightforward. He believed that at first a client would normally be closed, not open to experience, not self-aware, and as therapy progressed, they would be open to experience more self-aware, and have positive self-regard. Moving down to the goals of person-centered therapy. In person-centered therapy, the goals are set by the client. The counselor has no role in goal setting. 
that would be considered directive. So even though the counselor is not taking any role in setting goals, the counselor hopes that the client will experience congruence between self and experiences and move toward and eventually become self-actualized. So the client will progress toward self-actualization and eventually realize that self-actualization. So taking a look at these goals and keeping in mind the techniques and the theory of personality and the causes of symptoms in person-centered therapy, it's clear that it's much different as a because it's represented as a complete theory of counseling. It's much different than many of the other theories of counseling that were used at the time it was developed and that exists now. Which brings me to my opinion of how we can use the theory of person-centered counseling as we try to incorporate it, integrate it into our counseling style. Well, in my opinion, person-centered therapy has some very strong contributions to make, but also some significant weaknesses. On the positive side, you have the Therapeutic Alliance. And I think that the way the Therapeutic Alliance is described in person-centered therapy and utilized is very helpful and can be used or, or most of it can be used in other therapies, integrating other modalities together to generate and develop your counseling style. Several other theories essentially use the therapeutic alliance as described in person-centered therapy, but they accomplish the therapeutic alliance through a more directive approach. With that in mind, I think that we develop important counseling skills from practicing non-directiveness. And I think non-directiveness has a place in the counseling relationship as you progress with the therapy. I like the positive view of development that we see in the theory of person-centered therapy. I think it's useful to the client and I think it's a realistic way to look at human development. Also useful in this theory is the idea that we're helping the client to realize their full potential. I believe there are more useful and efficient ways to realize this potential, but person-centered therapy emphasizes the realization of this potential and I think that's important. Probably the most important contributions, at least for me and how I develop my counseling style, are the next three items. And these three items are popular among many counselors. And that is the idea of accurate empathy, so that basic empathy really isn't enough. We have to work to be accurate in the statements that we make that are designed to be empathetic. The next is the idea of unconditional positive regard, what we call the non-judgmental stance. This is a foundation of many uh, counseling theories. The idea that as counselors we're not here to make judgments, but rather have a positive regard for our clients that comes with no conditions attached. And then the third key concept is the idea of authenticity or genuineness. And this means that in the present moment with the client, we're going to be ourselves. We're going to be spontaneous. We're going to react to things that are said or behaviors that are exhibited. And I believe this authenticity uh, takes practice to develop, just as the non-judgmental stance does and the accurate empathizing does. But when it's done correctly and a counselor can be authentic, it has a positive impact on the client and helps build the therapeutic alliance. Now there are some areas of the theory of person-centered therapy that I do not believe are as useful. 
I view the uh, this theory in general as useful but incomplete. You remember the six conditions of client change that Rogers put forth. Uh, he believed they were necessary and sufficient. And my view, and this is a view that is relatively popular, is that those conditions are necessary, but they are not sufficient. If in repeated counseling sessions a counselor is only offering non-directive statements, not asking questions, not providing advice at any level to any degree throughout the relationship, I believe the result is usually a strained counseling relationship, meaning these techniques can be positive and helpful, but when they're adhered to rigidly, uh, eventually a client will become understandably frustrated that the counselor is not leading the conversation in one direction or another or offering any real advice. I think realistically, and I think this is understandable, at some point clients seek in the therapeutic relationship the opinion of the counselor. They want to know what counselors think of them. And we can offer this opinion, I believe, in many cases without making judgment, while maintaining accurate empathy, and while being authentic. So to summarize person-centered therapy, it is a useful therapy. At the time it was developed, it was quite different than the other counseling therapies that were available. It's had a significant impact on other theories of counseling. Again, with many theories of counseling adopting accurate empathy, the non-judgmental stance, and authenticity as part of the role of a counselor. And at the same time, this theory, particularly with the non-directive and non-advice giving component, may seem incomplete to many counselors and clients. I hope you found this video on the theory of person-centered therapy to be helpful. As always, if you have any questions or concerns, feel free to contact me and I'll be happy to assist you.